Last time, we talked about episode one of Prehistoric Planet. Let's go ahead, dive in, and talk about the wonderful creatures that are in the second episode. If you haven't taken the time to watch the speculative documentary, I'm really hoping that my video might convince you to go ahead and see it. All right, here we go. Episode two, Deserts. Right from the beginning, we're met with a group of traveling sauropods known as Dreadnoughtus. The size of these titans definitely cannot be overstated, clocking in at over 25 meters or about 85 feet in length. Just incredibly massive. I cannot imagine anything like that today. They are shown traveling for the purpose of fighting for dominance and mating. And I gotta say, just right off the bat, I love that they're depicted as hissing. That's something we don't really see an awful lot in paleo media. Normally on TV, sauropods are depicted as these very sluggish and gentle and exclusively making almost mooing noises. I thought the hissing was a nice touch because we do see that in other archosaurs that are alive today, including alligators. We're also very accustomed to seeing them depicted as these majestic, gentle giants, but getting to watch them fight for dominance here was a really nice change of pace for me. You get to watch them literally fight with everything that they have in their arsenal. They start stabbing each other with their claws, which I feel like a lot of people who aren't obsessed with dinosaurs might not realize this, but they didn't have elephantine-like feet. They actually had these really interesting claws on them, which people theorize that they used it for things such as digging out a nest. They start scraping each other with their teeth and also begin to bang each other with their own necks, much like we see giraffes do when fighting. And of course, the most visually interesting part of this segment would have to be the speculative air sacs that we see on the necks of these beefy animals. As any sauropod fanatic would know, these guys would have had hollow bones, making them surprisingly lightweight. Sauropods also seem to have had a sort of air sac within their bones, keeping them even lighter. You can see where they were literally anchored into the bone. I also enjoy how the air sacs on them can look very bird-like at times. There are also some mammals, fish, amphibians, reptiles that are also capable of possessing air sacs, but then again I am also looking for just about any bird reference I can find. The episode just started and I'm already enjoying the speculative nature of it. In the next segment, we get to watch a little lizard tiptoe around some Tarbosaurus, and wow, they just look incredible in this depiction. We see them with a beautiful pattern on their scales, and you should also be able to see some very tiny hair on parts of the body, like on top of the head. I don't know if any of these screenshots show it very well, but just take my word for it. Once again, I'm all for the depiction of both scales and feathers on the same animal. A group of Tarbosauruses taking a nap in the sun together is honestly something I didn't know I needed to see, but I really appreciate it here. And then we get the reveal of the Velociraptor. Just spectacular. I couldn't really contain my excitement as I was watching this part on my couch. I was so giddy because I just fell in love with the design instantly. Absolutely covered in feathers, this looks incredible. This is, to date, the best Velociraptor I have ever seen in media. Something else I also noticed right away is they aren't depicted as having split pupils. You'll see this a lot in dinosaur art and movies with them where they have these very cold reptilian eyes. So this was a refreshing change of pace. Obviously we don't know exactly what their pupil shape would have been, but it's nice to see a little bit of variety. But there is one trope they're using here, and that's pack hunting. Now, pack hunting among dinosaurs is a bit of a contentious topic. 
trust me, that is a really good way to watch two paleontologists get into a heated debate. Inferring what dinosaurs looked like from fossils alone is tough enough, then trying to speculate on what their actual behavior was like is a whole different animal. While I'm somewhere a bit in the middle, pack hunting is absolutely possible, but there's also an argument for not pack hunting, so there has not been any sort of conclusive evidence for one way or the other. And to get to the end of this segment, we are left with a really nice camera angle of pterosaurs picking at a corpse. This is absolutely something you would see in a nature documentary today. Next, we get to see what might actually be my favorite depiction in this entire series, and that is of a beautiful female Mononychus. The inspiration from a barn owl is very apparent here, and it just translates so beautifully to the screen. I also feel like the Mononychus was one of the best animated dinosaurs in the series. All of her subtle movements look incredibly convincing to me. Nothing looks too choppy or a little bit uncanny here, so yeah, definitely just the best looking thing overall. And I'm also not alone. She seems to be like a very popular creature online at the moment. I would also like to point out that barn owls don't hoot like a lot of other ones do, but instead they screech. So the entire time I kept picturing her making some awful, frightening sound. Anyways, the Mononychus is shown as being a bit of a bug muncher. They even go so far as to depict Mononychus as having a very long anteater-like tongue so that she can easily eat the termites. We are also treated to a very beautiful rain in the desert sequence. Wonderful desert flowers then begin to appear. Fun fact, did you know that flowers didn't evolve until about 130 million years ago? That means that some dinosaurs literally never saw flowers in their life. So yeah, there you go. Also, as far as the narration goes, I gotta say, David saying things such as, oh dear, gave me really big Winnie the Pooh vibes. Afterwards, we are taken to an oasis in the middle of the desert. The presence of an oasis is vital to life in this desert. In most cases, these are the only source of fresh water. Witnessing all of these different dinosaurs gathered together here, it's hard not to recall Disney's dinosaurs. Also, I appreciate getting to see a little bit of sense of scale. Mononychus absolutely looks like a dwarf in comparison to the Mongolian Titan. If you watch the background carefully, a Therizinosaur even makes a cameo in this spot. It's also hard not to appreciate the cinematography that's used throughout these episodes. There is an absolutely beautiful shot of one of the Tarbosauruses coming to the oasis for a drink. It was very refreshing to see that it wasn't some murder-crazed predator or anything like that, but just like all the other dinosaurs, they need water to survive. So yes, absolutely wonderful shot. And then later in this episode, you get to see Twitter's favorite, Barbarodactylus. This part of the episode was absolutely entertaining to watch. A large number of the pterosaurs are gathered atop of a cliff in order to try mating. Some of the males you see here are very large and menacing, while other pterosaurs have a bit of a different strategy. We see one male, Barbarodactylus, who doesn't have a very large head crest and honestly looks very feminine. And then he does something sneaky. In Cuttlefish today, you'll see very small males who aren't anywhere at all comparable to the very large dominant fish. Some of them will actually pretend to be females. This will bring the guard down of the very large macho cuttlefish, and when he's not looking, the sneaky male is able to mate with the female. And that is exactly what this pterosaur does. It's an excellent example of cunning versus aggression in nature. And finally, we're at the end of the episode where a herd of Cesare are traveling. 
Now, I've gotta be real with you guys. This might have been the least favorite of mine out of this episode. Just this whole segment made my eyes so itchy and watery just watching. It was just sand and more sand. But aside from that, we are also treated to more beautiful cinematography here. Some of these shots of them traveling are absolutely splendid. In fact, they are even speculated to have been traveling at night and had the ability to recognize stars. This helps them with navigating to the new feeding grounds. Now, this might be surprising to a lot of people, but there have been studies that show that certain animals can navigate by night through the use of stars. While we know very little on how they actually do it, it's still absolutely fascinating that they showed dinosaurs as possibly being able to do this as well. Once again, dispelling the myths that they were stupid and lazy. And there we have it. That's the second episode of Prehistoric Planet. I'm still really enjoying the designs of all the different animals, the speculative nature of what their environment would have looked like, as well as how they would have interacted in it. And yeah, also I'm just really loving the chonkosauruses we get to look at, so... Once again, I will absolutely recommend if you have not gotten to watch this yet, definitely do so as soon as you can. Thank you guys for watching this week's video. I'd love to know what was your favorite segment from this episode, or maybe you have a least favorite like I did. Feel free to comment down below, and maybe even consider giving this video a like if you learned anything new. Thanks so much again for watching this, and I'll see you guys next time.